Hello and welcome everyone. Today I'm joined by Gelaudi Saraya. Uh, Gelaudi Saraya is a professor of African Studies and um, International Relations at the University of New York. And today has joined me to talk about uh, Ethiopian, Ethiopian politics, uh, some historical backgrounds to the current uh, situation in the country uh, and a lot of other things that, that, that um, are relevant to today's Ethiopia. So thank you for taking the time to join me today, Galaudius. Thank you, Takalai, for inviting me and for this for the opportunity to discuss with you on some historical background, current affairs of Ethiopia. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. So we're going to we're going to we're going to start with the historical background, uh, Professor. And and if I may, I'm going to ask you to give us a picture of what Ethiopia was like pre, maybe during the Haile Selassie reign. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that that was your um, uh, your formative years, and you'll have an idea of what Ethiopia was like then. Because one of the narrative that we are told uh, today is that Ethiopia then was a harmonious country. There wasn't any of the problems that manifest in the country today, whether that is ethnic tensions, whether that is um, tribalism, and the other problem that seem to afflict today, um, they didn't exist then. That is what we are told, at least from a significant section of the political uh, class today. So we, I think it would be, many of my listeners would, would uh, especially given that most of my listeners are young people, so they wouldn't have any idea of what Ethiopia was like. So give us an idea of what it was like um, then, and maybe from a grand perspective as well. Okay, very well, that's very good. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I am actually to present myself with respect to Ethiopian history. Uh, uh, I'm going to actually uh, uh, utilize what I call historiography as opposed to mythology. So the, Ethiopia is a very ancient land, very ancient country, really. Uh, one of the very few countries like China and, and, and others that, that uh, exhibited continuity for a long period of time. But in order to understand how it evolved, it's very important to trace back to 2000 BCE. I, I say before Christ, I don't say before Christ, I say before the common era, because uh, I do have uh, Muslims and uh, Hindus and Jews in my class. So um, I cannot say before Christ, before the common era. 2000 before the common era, in a place called Gobedra near Aksum, a group of people made a transition from nomadic pastoral cattle breeding lifestyle to a sedentary uh, agricultural mode of production in Northern Tigray. About the same time, the incipient state, the very, very, very beginning of the uh, the, the formative period of, of the state itself was established uh, at uh, Mazabur, which is in East Tigray, Mazabur, uh, near Dagradam. The first state, sort of uh, a motley confederacy, we can say, led by Akhanus Saba, the first guy who organized the very, very incipient state is Akhanus. Saba. During those days, Saba was a, a gender neutral name. It could be for, for, a, for a woman, it could be for a man. So Akhan Saba is the first guy. But gradually, the state became bigger and bigger and stronger. And by 1850, 1850, before the Common Era, Ethiopia came uh, into being as the first leader of the strong state. This is in Mazabur. Mazabur is just between, so that the, uh, the audience can understand it. It's, it's between, between, between uh, 
Adigrat and Adwa. There's a, a highway, a road via Debradamo. It's located right there, actually. So that's the beginnings of the, the, the states, the very, very states. And for Gobedra and Mazabur, by the way, uh, thanks to my classes that I teach, African civilization classes, we actually have evidence, archaeological and documentary evidence of uh, these two sites of Gobedra and Mazabur. Uh, so it's not, it's not mythological. But anyway, it's verified, therefore, because of archaeology, archaeological findings and documentary evidences. But there is some mythology that overrides historiography, which I'm not going to accept it. That's the so-called the so-called Solomonic dynasty. So-called the Solomonic dynasty. And then and, 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 and those historians who want to follow, pursue the Solomonic dynasty, the one to begin with Queen Saba, also known as Queen Sheba or Makda. But uh, the, the problem is uh, uh, Saba or Makda actually was the 52nd monarch in the list of monarchs. So she reigned around 1013 before the common era. This is hundreds of years after Ethiopia's, okay? And, and then she could not be the first the monarch of uh, ancient Ethiopian kingdom. And her son followed her, of course, Manilik, according to the Solomonic dynasty. But this is false, because like I told you, she is the 52nd monarch. And then, and, and by the way, there is uh, one book uh, written on the Solomonic dynasty known as Kivra Negus which I want to show it right here, Kuranagas. This was written in the, in the 13th century, actually. The Kuranagas, Glory of Kings, that talks about uh, Solomonic and what have you, the connection of Saba to Solomon and Menelik as the son of Solomon and Saba, blah, blah, blah. But uh, 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 several hundred years after-, well, after... Galaudi, sorry to, to interject, but who was it written by? The Glory of the Kings, who, who was the, the author, if, if I may. The author of who? Of, of the book. The that Kubra Nagas, just... actually, yeah. the author is not known. This one was compiled by uh, Miguel Brooks, a scholar. But the author of the Kubra, that's a good question, by the way. No one knows that it was, it was incredible. When I read the Chronicle, actually, it's a very confusing, but systematically written book to legitimize you see, to legitimize uh, the powers that be so that they can get acceptance from the people. It came from somewhere. But incredibly, uh, uh, the, the great Aksumite kingdom, when it evolved uh, 100 years uh, after Ethiopia, all those kings that reigned in Aksum never claimed they were actually part of the Solomonic dynasty. They never even mentioned Solomon. None of them. So uh, that's the thing, you know. So uh, Aksum is going to begin around 50 before the common era, 100 after, uh, we, we call it common era anyway. Okay? So the first king is going to be the scholars of Aksum. The scholars is going to expand the kingdom of Aksum up to the Red Sea. He was the first one to actually really incorporate the port of Adulis. Okay? This is the scholars. After the scholars, so many kings are going to come, like, you know, uh, uh, great kings like uh, Indubis, who created money uh, as medium of exchange, and then Aphilas, another great king after him. And then during the uh, between 270 and 300, a, a common era, the great Absumite of Stellas or obelisks were going to be constructed, great, great civilization, uh, uh, incomparable, actually. Uh, none of the uh, other kingdoms were incomparable to the Aksumite thing. And then the Aksum during the time covered when it expanded more up to the period of Ezana, especially 300 uh, common era or 320 common era 
it expanded, it, it incorporated much of present day Ethiopia, Eritrea, and then Kush, which is Nubia, with Northern Sudan. And then, and then gradually um, during the, uh, during Caleb, which is around 517 common era, it's gonna incorporate Yemen, Southern, Southern, Southern Arabia. So it was really a, a very expansive and big empire. So we're talking about now between those scholars who reigned around 100 common era, then last king of, uh, of Aksum is gonna be Dil Naot, 940, 940 common era. So if you, if you can calculate 940 minus 100, you're gonna have eight centuries, stable, solid states and kingdom and empire, okay? There was a long, long, long period of stability and civilization, okay? Uh, so by 940, then a few years after that, of course, the decline of Aksum, and then a few years after that, by 1000 common era, the Zagwe dynasty, which is in North Central Warlaw, now popular in, popularly known as, as, as Lalibala. But Lalibala was not the first king, actually. There is some mythology in there. That Lalibala built all those things. And, 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 and. The first king of the Zagwe actually is Merra Taklai Manot, 1000 BCE. And then his son, and others, and others, and others. His son, Merara. And then others come, like, you know, many of them, uh, Ibrahana Christos. And then Lalibala comes later on. So it survived, the Zagwe dynasty is more or less a medieval civilization. Look at the Rakhon church. Similar to the Rakhon church we have in Lalibala, we have them in Tigray too. In, time, in fact, in Tigray, we have like 130 of them. People don't know about this. In Lalibala, we have 11 of them, of the Rakhon church, okay? So it's gonna, it's gonna continue until the, the, the last quarter of the, 12th, 13th century, 1270. Then Ikonamalak is going to come, and then uh, after that, a relatively weak state, actually, really. Uh, and then another guy is going to come after Ikonamalak, uh, who will expand more the state. And then, of course, we're going to enter into, into uh, the 16th century, 1520s. This is the era of uh, Muhammad Grain, who came and invaded the entire <laughs> Ethiopia. It was, it was really bad. It was very destructive, actually. And interestingly, Muhammad Grain was supported by the Ottoman Turk. They gave him guns and munitions. Very much they, they, they have done today, the Turks have done in the war of Tigray. It's incredible. Sometimes they say history repeats itself. Okay, so Muhammad Grain was devastating. After Muhammad Grain, the state was weakened. Uh, the state was weakened, and then there was an opportunity for the Oromo migration from Southern Ethiopia into almost all Ethiopia, East Ethiopia, West Ethiopia, North Ethiopia. They've come up to Azobo, Raya, in Tigray. So the, the Oromos were, were evolving their own dynasties, especially in world law, like Warheimono and Yeju. These are Oromo, Oromo dynasties. The Azobo, to some extent, was a dynasty to Integrai. But Integrai, they were completely uh, assimilated into the Tigrinya culture. So there is no sign of Oromo language in Tigray now, as you can see in world law. They, they've seized some, some area in Gondar as well. Uh, soon after that, of course, we're going to have uh, the Gondorian period, beginning 1620s. Well, Susunias is the first king, and then his son Fasiladas is going to come after him. It's going to continue uh, with, with uh, uh, two Johannes, three Johannes, as a matter of fact, and then two Iasus, and then after the assassination of the first Iasus in 1706, there's going to be crisis in Gondar. 
after the crisis, uh, Yasutu comes to power, and Mintuwa is the mother of Yasutu. And then uh, the, 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 she was the grandson of Ioas, uh, the, the first Oromo king in Gondra. After, after that, uh, the so-called Zaman Masafent or era of princess is going to emerge because, uh, because the Gondarian uh, state could not continue. It was in shambles. Uh, and then with the invitation of uh, uh, some nobility from Gondor, uh, Mikael Sahul from Tigray is going to go there to broker peace uh, between them. But Mikael Sahul, this is 1769 now, OK? With uh, Mikael Sahul going there and fighting Eos, he deposed Eos, he killed his Eos. He himself became <laughs> became actually the, the governor of Gondor and Tigray. And then, and then that's the beginning of the era of princess, 1769 to 1855. And 1855, as we all know, no, no, after, after Mikhail Sohun, of course, there were many aristocratic uh, uh, dynasties in Tigray, Wolda Selassie and Nderta, and the Swagadis in Agame. But these were governing the whole of Tigray. Swagat is, for instance, governing the whole of Tigray and Eritrea. Uh, okay. Then after them, of course, is going to come to Edros. To Edros is going to fight all the aristocrats in Gondor, in Gojam, in, Gon, in, 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 in Simeon, and in Shoah as well. So he's going to try to reify uh, Ethiopia as we know it today. So the first modern king of Ethiopia is Tewedros. After him comes Johannes, as we know. After Johannes comes Menelik. After Menelik comes well, a short period of Lij Iyasu for three years only, and Zoditu before Iyasu, after Iyasu, until 1930. In 1930, Emperor uh, Ras Safari becomes Emperor Haile Selassie. The long reigning monarch in Ethiopian history is Emperor Haile Selassie. 1930 to 1974. So this is it. The brief, uh, if I keep on going, we're going to be there the whole day. We're going to be there the whole day. So I'm not going to do that. This is the historical background of how Ethiopia. However, how do we define Ethiopia now? You see, some people say it's a nation state, some it's an empire, some it's a republic, some. And, uh, my understanding is uh, 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 the, the way Ethiopia evolved and later on it, by even subjugating people, some people, and then forming a central government like Menelik did, for instance. Many, many countries have gone through that route, actually, really. They evolved that way. It's not unique to Ethiopia, OK? Uh, so. Uh, uh, Ethiopia is uh, defined actually like uh, what Aristotle said a long time ago, congeries of states uh, put together by military power, he says. In fact, to his credit, uh, uh, the judge Mazzode Gabriel Selassie uh, mentions this in his book, Johannes uh, 4, Johannes 4, his book, Johannes 4. And so a congeries of states means mostly of uh, kingdoms put together, you know, like different nationalities and what have you. But as uh, I see uh, across the world, many states were actually formed that way. Now we have a new term coined recently to actually uh, define countries like China and Ethiopia, which had continued from a long period of time. It's called civilization states. This is a new term now. There was nation, there was nation state, empire, kingdom. Now we have civilization state. Those who managed to continue, those who exhibited continuity are called civilization states. But a civilization state is not necessarily a harmonious state in terms of culture and the economy and what have you. Ethiopia, for instance, is a diverse state, diverse, diverse country, really. China, by contrast, although there is diversity in China, 
the Han majority, the Han majority, the majority of the Chinese people are Han. And, 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 and then that gives, uh, gives it an edge to China to become a civilization state. So we can characterize that way. It's a, a, I mean, uh, uh, sort of controversial, but that's the way they are defined. So that's how I see how the, the, the Ethiopian state evolved. Hmm. Well, we, yeah, we're going, to, we're going to come to what Ethiopia has evolved into, what Ethiopia is today, whether it's a nation or a state, and uh, whether it's um, the other controversial um, categorizations. Uh, but thank you for your fascinating account of the historical evolution of, of Ethiopia um, as a country. Let, let's just settle um, for, the, for the word country for now. Um, and you raised many, many interesting um, issues in terms of the history of Ethiopia and also in the light of the accepted myth or history of Ethiopia today. One of the things um, that really uh, struck me was that you seem to be very, very categorical in your rejection of, of the um, Solomonic uh, dynasty thing, for instance, of, yeah. is one of the accepted sort of of the rocks and foundations of the country today. Um, and I was just wondering if you, if, if you don't accept that um, storyline, the Solomonic um, dynasty, I'm just thinking in terms of the thing that, that follow from that, like for instance, the Ark of the Covenant um, in, in action, what do you make of, 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 of that? I, I know that some people say um, it's a myth, um, other people, I think it was the, the author of the, um, the, the sign and the seal, maybe I could be wrong. Um, so that the Ark of the Covenant indeed exists in 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 Aksum. Mm. Where do where do you where do you stand um, in that? I, I mentioned that only because it's one of the one of the foundations of of Ethiopia today. Yeah, well, you see, it, it got to, we have to be extremely careful because I myself have written extensively on Ethiopian history and uh, uh, ancient Ethiopian, medieval Ethiopian, because I teach about it. It's so simple. Solomon, Solomonic dynasty has nothing to do with Ethiopian history, has nothing to do, I can tell you that much. It's a mythology. But anyway, all nations, all societies do have mythology. The Greeks had mythology, <laughs> the Romans had mythology, uh, the, the, so many mythologies. Because like I told you, during the whole period of 800 years of the Aksumite kingdom, none of the kings mentioned Solomon, none, none of them. It's after Yukon in 1270. And that's during that time that Kuranagas was written because Yukon was struggling actually. He sometimes said, uh, 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 I am from Aksum. He even said, I belong to Dilnaud, the last king of Aksum. Why? He wants to get legitimacy. Murat Haiman say the same thing. We're from Aksum. The Zagwe came from Aksum. Uh, and then and, 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 uh, 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 that of Murat Haiman makes sense because uh, the uh, elite military force in Aksum were Ago. Most of them were Ago, the founders of Zagwe dynasty. Okay? And that of Ekonomilak. But then Amdusian comes after, after Ekonomilak. He was not saying anything about the Solomon. He was just trying to incorporate, he was fighting the Adal and what have you. And uh, the, he, he came over and incorporated Tigray as well, expanded Ethiopia. Amdusian was a powerful guy. Okay? So the Gondarian period and others and others as well. But once it started as, as so-called Solomonic, the other kings, even Haile Selassie himself, the last emperor, he was claiming to the Solomonic dynasty. He belonged to uh, uh, Yehuda, the Yehuda thing, you know, incorporated it. All of them said that, but, but, but that's false. It has nothing to do with Ethiopian history, really. Hmm. So, yeah, another... Um... Um, also because it leads us into what I want us to talk about today. Um, another um, historical parallel you, you mentioned is that of um, China and Ethiopia. You, you said that 
both of them have the long um, established and continuous civilization. Yeah. Um, and also you said that the, the Chinese have managed to become homogenous, whereas Ethiopia, well, Ethiopia, as we know, it is as heterogeneous as the country uh, can be today. Now, I, I'm not going to ask you why is it that Ethiopia hasn't, you know, historically become homogenous? What, what, what is the reason why uh, various nations like the Tigray nation and the Oromo nation maintain their distinctiveness? But I think one thing that people want to know now is if the distinctiveness um, a reason enough for um, nations within Ethiopia like Tigray to seek to demand independence and what do you say what is your reaction as a historian as someone who who knows how countries um, develop and evolve and as someone who knows how other countries have used forces to assimilate and to forcefully um, submerge other cultures. What do you say when, when the Oromos, for instance, seek for, for independence, when the Tigrayans seek for, for, for independence, do you see validity in their claim or is it something that is delusional to you as a historian? Okay, that's a very good question. Very good question. It's controversial, I understand. Uh, however, what people don't really underscore is uh, 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 that Ethiopia, like many, many, many nations around the globe, the evolution of the Ethiopian state is similar to many, many, many of them. Uh, in fact, if you if you now uh, see uh, uh, or try to uh, investigate the nation, so-called nation states around the world, the only one nation with one language, one culture, one uh, 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 religion, whatever, is Japan. There is no nation in the world that's not diverse, that's not, it, it's all, all of the nations in the world are heterogeneous, really. So it's not unique to Ethiopia. Uh, everywhere you go, for instance, if you go to Sudan, people think of the, they speak Arabic and what? Arabic, actually, they are not even Arabs. They speak Arabic because of religion, of Arab influence from the Middle East and what have you. But there are 115 languages in Sudan. 115 languages. People don't know this. They're very distinct people. Uh, actually, diversity you can see. Everywhere you go. Uh, I mean, Nigeria has 250 languages. This is where the, Nigeria was made by the colonizers, of course was forged as a colony. But 250 languages, there is no nation around the world that is one language, one economy, one whatever, one whatever. It's all diverse. So the, 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 if there is oppression, you can fight against oppression. Uh, you can also even want to be independent or to secede. Uh, that's what Article 39 of the Ethiopian Constitution try to articulate as a matter of fact. However, uh, people also don't understand how globalization is going to really, really uh, uh, influence arts in terms of nations are competing in the, in the global arena. If you go separate ways, you're not going to compete in the global arena. If you are united, bigger. Like Lenin said a long time, bigger is better. Bigger is better. Small nations don't do well in the global economy. Okay? They have become, actually, most of them, I've seen the East European countries. I've seen Yugoslavia, that was the, 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 the many, many, like Serbia and uh, Croatia and what have you. Mm, uh, they're not doing well at all. They've become, actually, really mm, uh, nations that are being assisted by the World Bank, IMF, and then charities from the West. <laughs> they are not a viable nations at all. East Europe was run after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union by Western capitalists and banks and what have you. With the exception of Hungary, all of them are now don donor <laughs> dependent nations. East Europe, can you imagine? So uh, you got to have a look at that too. 
wishing to be separate and that uh, emotion, I can understand it. But the consequence of it, you have to see ahead of time. It's consequence. So uh, sometimes I suggest to myself, okay, as long as we live in a federal democratic society, autonomous entities, why can't we live together? Why not? I mean, you cannot compete with Europe. You cannot compete with the United States, with Japan, with the tigers in, 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 in uh, East Asia. These are very successful countries. You cannot. So our best bet is to have a, a larger, bigger unity and then live together. Uh, as long as, as uh, the uh, fundamental rights of the people are respected by the constitution. I don't, I don't need, I don't see why we cannot live together. Because I am a Pan-Africans, that's why I'm saying that. I believe in the unity of the African continent. I believe in the unity of the Ethiopian nation as well. But Tigray should be autonomous. In fact, Tigray should be, should enjoy greater autonomy. Oromia should enjoy greater autonomy than Nishangur. And, and others and others and others. But we can live together and then and then beat the global challenge. That's the only way out. Well, you, you say that Tigray should enjoy um, greater autonomy. I mean, you mentioned other things as well in terms of the um, Eastern European country. And you say that the, you attributed their sorry state of affairs today to the decisions they took in 1991 and around um, that time, I, 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 I suppose. Um, I think um, maybe to just play the devil's advocate a little bit, someone might say, well, the reason they are where they are is not because of the decision that they took in terms of becoming independent from one another, but because of other factors um, that I don't have anything off the top of my, of my head, but maybe there are other factors someone might might contend. But anyway, to go to to Ethiopia, uh, Professor, you say that Tigray should enjoy more um, autonomy. And I think it's quite difficult for, for a lot of people to, to articulate what that autonomy should, um, should mean and should look like. I think for some people, it comes in the form of independence. Uh, for some people, it, it becomes in the form of it comes in the form of getting more agency within Ethiopia. And uh, for, for other people, it comes in the form of um, other things. But I just want to, to take you back to 1974 when the TPLF um, started the, the armed struggle. One of the, well, actually the raison d'etre, as far as they were concerned then, was that Ethiopia was an oppressive state and that Tigray deserved more autonomy. Um, I think including, um, well, up to secession, um, it later became. And I just wanted to ask you from, for you to to reflect um, from your from your recollections, what Tigray was like then, what people thought then, not the TPLF people, but the the average people in in, in Tigray. What was the the sentiment in terms of Ethiopia? What did Tigray mean to people when they said Tigray, for instance? Did it include Western Tigray? Did it include Lalibela, for instance? Was there a clear sort of map or picture of what Tigray meant um, then? Yeah, this is uh, uh, rather uh, difficult to un un answer. However, uh, it's a complicated tale. You know, uh, the, when when uh, when uh, uh, the TPLF uh, uh, started fighting for the uh, for the uh, not uh, initially it was for independence of Tigray, as a matter of fact, but 1983. They've changed their agenda. They say, "Well, I think if I may, if I may, if I may step in, I think the the official narrative is that there were um, they floated the idea of independence in the beginning, but they quickly changed it to just more autonomy without clearly yes. define, yeah. defining what the autonomy should mean. So I don't think it was independent um, because you know a lot of people say that the CPLF wanted independence all along, but when they found themselves in the comfortable position of controlling the whole of Ethiopia, they jettisoned the quest of independence and then they they, they made it more sort of um, secession when and if necessary. But I, I think 
they had already thrown out the idea of independence from, from early on. No, no, you're right. You, you, you are right. However, the, the name itself, Tigray Liberation Front. You see, the name itself says it. Liberate Tigray. Liberate from what? From who? Okay? So they made it clearer in 1983, almost 10 years after they, they initiated the guerrilla warfare. 1983, they clearly stated the intention is not not to secede from Ethiopia, but to fight for, for the self-determination of the people of Tigray. Self-determination, or meaning like self-determination. We know it all. If you don't secede, if you're for self-determination, that means for relative autonomy, okay? So they made it clearer, actually. Uh, incidentally, in 1989, 1989 is uh, two years before EPRDF actually uh, uh, assumed the state power. 1989, uh, 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 Melas came to the United States. And uh, we were- So, we so were, just to our listeners, 1989 Ethiopian calendar, right? No, 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 European calendar. Oh, yeah, all right, yeah, yes, yeah, because I stand they took, corrected. They took part in 1991, you remember? All right, yes, so yes. I'm talking on, I don't count by the Ethiopian thing because I, I've lived here for a long time. So 1989, uh, uh, Gregorian calendar, he came over. It was a surprise, actually. It was like a surprise. Somebody called and they, somebody said, someone wants to talk to you. And then I've gone to that place and Melissa then is sitting right there. He was my, my college mate at Addis Ababa University. I know him very well. So we talked. And then and I, I raised the question of what he just asked me now. I said to him, actually, uh, do you have any intention to have a pan-Ethiopian thing other than the Tigray thing? I said to him, actually. Although he did not answer, he gave me almost a clue that they are heading towards that thing, okay? So uh, after a couple of years after that, they founded the APRDF, Ethiopian Press, along with uh, some people uh, like uh, uh, those who were part of the APRP actually. So, so it was a pan-Ethiopian thing when they, who moved into Addis and captured state power. So uh, uh, I think that was because they've calculated everything. They understood that it's not to the benefit of the people of Tigray to simply succeed and fight and fight forever. And uh, the strategy was clever and it actually really crushed the military government of uh, Mengistu Haidamara. Had they confined themselves to Tigray, Mangusu could have mobilized the Ethiopian people and continue the war for a long period of time. So they've mobilized, they've formed an Ethiopian group, they've gone into Addis. That was a clever, clever move as, as a matter of fact. It was clever, really. So after that, they, as we know it, of course, they, they founded the new state of Ethiopia. Democratic Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. So, so, so would you would you say that it was it was again? I, I don't want us to get into the weeds of the constitution, but in, in broad terms, would you say that um, writing the constitution in the way they did, and especially Article 39, um, providing for um, secession, um, almost, I think, I, I don't know the, the details, but um, every nation in the country had the right to secede yeah. whenever it wants to, um, unilaterally, um, except for some administrative procedure. But as far in, in terms of the fundamentals, I think it's, it's, it's uni, unilaterally. So, a lot of people say that that was the only way to pacify the demands of, of that many nations, not just the Greg, but also Oromos and the others had in terms of 
their understanding of Ethiopia and how they thought um, how oppressive it was. And the only guarantee that they could be given in 1991 was to be told that if you don't like the arrangement, you could leave anytime. And that would the only arrangement that would have, for instance, um, allayed the fears of many Tigrans as well, who had by then developed a very hostile attitude towards Ethiopia because of what it had historically done to to to, to Tigray. Maybe you would dispute some of the um, uh, some of the characterizations, but was it right to write the Cornish decision uh, in the way that it was written in 1991? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the Ethiopian constitution, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, 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 the constitution that was uh, uh, really written by the APRDF is one of the best in Ethiopian history. We see things are relative. Uh, there was constitution during the emperor. Uh, there was more or less no constitution during the Rang period. And then we had all of a sudden a constitution that recognizes the autonomy of uh, of uh, different nations and nationalities in Ethiopia for the first time in Ethiopian history. And it produced nine autonomous states, okay? Uh, uh, before, 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 before the, the establishment of the nine autonomous, uh, there was a plan actually to restructure Ethiopia. Mm, uh, uh, with uh, 17 autonomous states. The nine plus six in southern Ethiopia, plus Addis Ababa, plus Harar. That would have been good, actually. But they changed their mind. Uh, they put uh, the southern part of Ethiopia into one, like Sidama, Walaita, and Kambata, and Hadiya, and others, and others. But the initial plan was to have six autonomous regions in the southern part, as a matter of fact. They did not do it. They've gone with a nine one as an option. Uh, but the, even the nine ones, to some extent, who were administering themselves, they were, they were highly dependent on the central government. The central government became much bigger than them. The central government was very, very centralized. So that was the main problem. Uh, uh, and on top of that, like you mentioned, Article 39. Article 39 is good because it guarantees the independence of, uh, independence of uh, the autonomous uh, regions and then potentially other nationalities as well. However, the secession clause was problematic because what we have not understood, because I myself am a witness, uh, the constitution was sent to us to New York at Columbia University. We discussed the constitution before it was uh, it was uh, it was proclaimed actually, and then long before that, uh, you know that the 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 the, 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 the the APRDF uh, uh, leaders is a legacy of the Ethiopian student movement because uh, the question of nationality was raised by the Ethiopian students. Walulun Mokonnen wrote on it, and then they actually were bottom, they took it from the Ethiopian students. But what the Ethiopian students did not understand, what the APRDF also did not understand is, although this is a copycat of Stalin, what they've not understood is uh, Stalin never said each state has to go separate ways. The reason we guarantee autonomy and then and, and, uh, the right to secession is to have a bigger unity. That's what Stalin said. But no, nobody read that, that, that phrase. To have a higher unity is not to go separate ways. You see? That is another problem. Sometimes we do things. Wasn't much. wasn't sorry to to cut in, but again, wasn't one of the mantra of the TPLF that there is beauty in diversity? Well, actually, the the motto was um, unity in diversity. So uh, they seem to have 
recognized that yes, there is yes, there is yes, there is yes, something yes. to be gained by by diversity. Yes, yes, you're right, you're right, absolutely right. In fact, not only they seem to have recognized in Article 39 itself, it's A, B, C, there are A, B, C, D in Article 39. If a, 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 a kulil or a, 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 a beher wants to succeed, there are preconditions to that. Number one, two thirds of the members of that kulil, of that whatever, Tigray, Sidama, or Oromia, should support the uh, <clears throat> secession. And number two, uh, uh, the federal government has to uh, investigate and study uh, the request of that nationality for at least three years, it says. And then number four, number three, even after it is uh, recognized, the uh, property and assets and exchange between the federal government and that color has to go through certain legal procedures. So it was kind of, kind of uh, not encouraging to succeed. <laughs> it takes three years and all of that. And that. So they've, they've knew that the consequence of uh, going separate ways. They've understood it very well. Like he said, they have recognized it. And then unity and diversity. And then you remember the, the nationalities day every year, people coming from all over. And then we are different, but we are one. That is the significance of the nationalist day. It was, it was really good, actually, really, relatively speaking, that of EPR day was the best. Uh, but uh, my, my, my suggestion is, uh, if we have to redeem now, the worst regime came in Ethiopia anyway, unfortunately. So the, the people are gonna really, uh, <laughs> uh, and I remember very well, uh, in 1974, we were down with Haile Selassie, down with Haile Selassie. And then the, the, there was no organized body to lead the revolution. And then uh, the, the, the military hijacked it. The worst regime came. Then we started, we started saying Haile Selassie was good. Now also people are saying if they would have been the best. We've, we're doing very well, 27 years of, of uh, 27 years of stability and peace. Now, Ethiopia is completely destroyed. It's the worst regime we have now. So, uh, uh, but anyway, if, uh, if history is gonna be kind to the Ethiopian people, and then, and then uh, <clears throat> is relative peace in Tigray now, but uh, there is no peace in the rest of Ethiopia. Conflicts are going on, fighting in Oromia, fighting everywhere. But once we we've, uh, make, make a transition from this conflict thing, via dialogue or via whatever, then uh, we have to restructure Ethiopia uh, based on the constitution. But I propose that we have to have at least 20 autonomous uh, uh, regions in Ethiopia. You can't, you can't have 83 of them. It's impossible, but at least 20 of them, you know, so that we can have greater autonomy and, and, and then more freedom to people, more and more independence, more rights to people. That's the only way we can redeem the, the problem that we're facing now. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's, um, that's, that's fair enough, um, but there are a lot of controversial um, or at least um, provisions that people have very, very strident views on. So Article 39 is one of them. And the way regions are constituted is also another. And actually, that is the main source of root of the, the conflict now between Amharas and, and, and Tigrayans in terms of the yeah. um, Western Tigray. 
um, and southern Tigray as well, but also other um, territories. And I'm going to take it back to 1974 because I think that that's going to give us a bit of context in terms of what borders and sense of identities and sensibilities then meant to 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 people. So you said that at university you were you were chanting with students down had a lesson and 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 all that. What were you your sensibilities that were you saying that as an Ethiopian first to use a, to use such a um, um, hackneyed language in Ethiopia, whether the Tigray first, Ethiopia first thing. Or um, were you a, a, a Tigray nationalist first then? Or um, when you went to Tigray, for instance, and had conversations with people, what were their sensibilities with the, would the thing that people in Tigray would have been saying then be the same to what people in, say, Gwajam would have been saying in terms of the, the regime? Or was there an, an ethnic element to the demands that people had in 1974? And also, I tried to mention that earlier, what, 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 what was Tigray then? I think it, people would want to know what Tigray meant then. What would, for instance, somebody who came to Addis Ababa from al um have identified as then, or someone who came from, say, Humora to, 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 to Addis Ababa? What were them, the allegiances and sensibilities and identities then? Uh, yeah, uh, see, the thing is, uh, by the way, when when the question of nationalities was raised in in, in Addis Ababa University, then when Haile Selassie University, uh, those those who were promoting the nationalities question actually were pan Ethiopianists. They were pan Ethiopians themselves. They actually they. they, they uh, they want to completely uh, uh, change the political system so that it guarantees uh, rights to nationalities. Land is the tiller was one of the slogans. Equality of nation and nationalities was one other slogan. And then equality of women was another one. All these slogans, but within the scope of the Ethiopian thing. It's not going to be an Ethiopian empire. It's going to be a republic, of course. As, 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 far, as far as it was uh, envisioned by, by the students, okay? But they were pan Ethiopian. They were, in fact, internationalists for the most part. They were supporting international movements in Zimbabwe and <laughs> other places and other places, okay? They were not really like narrow thing with one nationality and others and others. Uh, but nowadays I see more of a parochial more of a narrow thing, uh, the, the, the confining to one nationality only. And then, and, and, and then the overarching uh, uh, identity or whatever you call it is forgotten almost now. So the, the Tigran used to identify during the Haile Selassie period, of course, as a Tigran, but as an Ethiopian as well. The Romos, there are so many of them, in, uh, within the government of Haile Selassie, uh, like you know, the, many many of them actually, they were they they were uh, almost the, they identify themselves with the overarching Ethiopian identity as well. That's not happening now. You see, uh, like Bulcha de Meksa and then the uh, uh, finance minister during Haile Selassie, they were all Muhammad Hassan's book. Uh, professor at uh, at uh, Georgia University here in the United States, he says the Orom of Ethiopia, because there are Oromos in Kenya as well. So the Oromos of Ethiopia, that's clear. It, it's just telling you that way. So during those days, actually, although you are from from uh, Amhara or from Wallo or from Tigray or from whatever, you still identify as an Ethiopian. That was it then, but not now. <laughs> now we have a problem because I see people identifying themselves. In fact, I see myself when I was advocating for the last two years for the cause of Tigray because of the, of the war on Tigray. Uh, and people come with the Tigray flag. They identify themselves as a Tigray. They don't want even say Ethiopian, the word Ethiopian. 
never. Same thing happens to others, to Oromo as well. Uh, and then even the Amharas themselves, <laughs> who were telling us just yesterday, yesteryear, that they are actually the promoters of Ethiopia and all those things, they've forgotten it completely. Now they are saying we have to secede from the Federation. This is a new movement going with the Amhara elite themselves. They had recently uh, a meeting in Washington, DC. And then uh, they, they condemned the TPLF and others and others, but they wanna have, uh, an, and then recently also there is a movement called uh, uh, People's Front, Amhara People's Front. This is a Shalak Adawit group. And uh, what do they want? <laughs> They used to say Ethiopia. They never mentioned Ethiopia now. They're talking about Amahara, Amahara only. So the, the, it has become like a vogue that you identify yourself with your nationality, not with the overarching identity. So, so yeah, yeah that's, that's good. But in terms of the, the founders of the TPLF in 1974 in, in holding the view that they, they 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 had, which was to say that Ethiopia was an oppressive state, and the oppression wasn't evenly distributed across Ethiopia of all races, but it was it was mainly wielded against the grants, for instance, which was why they felt the need to to start an, an a, a, a guerrilla warfare and to to free um, Tigray from 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 Ethiopia. Would you say that that view was an exception? rather than the, the, the norm in Integrate then? No, no, no. I myself have uh, supported that idea in 1974. At that design university, the, interestingly, the students had uh, study clubs. And we used to come together and, and then talk, uh, argue, and over-argue sometimes. I remember very well, like Mala Zenawe, the other Mala Stakle, and then... Uh, 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 Aragawi Berhe himself was there uh, the, because they were organizing a Tigrayan organization in campus in Addis Ababa University. I supported it. There were the Oromos also, like uh, Obama Mutuku, who were trying to organize Oromo Teng before they founded the OLF. Obama Mutuku is one of the founders of the, of the Oromo Liberation Front, but he, he was killed early on. Uh, uh, so some of us were like pan Ethiopian term. It's okay. We actually, the interesting thing is uh, we used to tolerate those ideas. We used to really respect someone's ideas instead of rejecting them. So it's good to start with nationalities as well. Then as you can see later on, TPLF started its guerrilla in 1975. But at the same time, EPRP and Mason an Ethiopian group emerged as well. Uh, the Pan-Ethiopian thing did not, did not uh, succeed. It's the nationality front that succeeded, specifically the TPLF was more organized, more, it mobilized the people. It was more successful. But even the TPLF, like we said earlier, were entertaining the idea of Pan-Ethiopian later on, EPRDF became EPRDF instead of TPLF. Uh, the, it was a blessing for Ethiopia, actually, that, that TPLF uh, had to go through that change. It was, it was a blessing for Ethiopia. It was good. Uh, that's how I see it. So I have no problem with nationality thing. I respect them, even now, by then, so that you know, uh, so that you know, uh, I belong to many Tigrayan organizations in North America. We have the Tigray Forum and others and others, but I also belong to uh, uh, the Solidarity of Nations in Ethiopia. It's called SON, S-O-N-E, Solidarity of Nations in Ethiopia. I am in there. So we are from Tigray, we are from Oromo, we have Benishangul, we have uh, the command, we have Agos, we have Somalis, we have Olaitas, many of them. Why are we there? We want to come together and then fight the oppression that's still going on because Ali Ahmed still continues to fight the nationalities. He was, he was fighting the Somalis in uh, Southeast Ethiopia. 
the Benishangos and the Kamans and the Agros uh, in northern Ethiopia. So we wanna we wanna we wanna come together and have a common agenda. Although we are different nationalities, you see. So I am in there as well. So I actually support both of them, mm -hmm. the nationality mm -hmm. calls and the the pan Ethiopian as well. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, but I, I think maybe you, you're going to correct me if my if I mischaracterize your political views over the past. Um, decades maybe the past decade especially since i knew you and i was reading what you um what you wrote what you have been writing and you seem to 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 be very critical of of, of the epidf administration um what was your main source of I, I think with the benefit of hindsight now everybody knows that the, the administration was um fundamentally flawed and mistaken in, in in the direction that it took the country and also that sort of explains why we are where we are. But what was your main source of beef then? Why were you so critical of, of the APRDF and what did you see coming? I say that, yeah, yeah, that's very good, by the way, you brought that thing. I'm, I'm glad you brought that question because I, I, I can have an opportunity now to clarify that thing. Uh, but those who know me very well, uh, understand what I was up to. Uh, uh, I criticized the APRD for sure. I have written a book actually, the, so that you can have a look. This is a book, Ethiopia, Democracy, Devolution of Power, and the Developmental State. In this book, it was, it was published in 2013, almost, uh, what, 10 years? 10 years ago. 11 years, 10 years, uh, almost. 23, yeah, 10 years ago. So in this book, I do criticize the APRDF for being non-democratic, for imprisoning uh, the journalists. A journalist writes something and they put him behind bars. It was not sensible to me at all. And then I was expecting them to have a broader, uh, a broader agenda where they can actually flourish uh, political culture. It was an opportunity for the APRDF, actually 27 years of stability, but that was, that was not done either. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, uh, the, I, have, I have actually dedicated so many chapters in this book where I really, really uh, praise uh, the APRDF for the foundational economy for the change they brought to Ethiopia. In the history of Ethiopia, modern history, no one is comparable to APRDF in terms of transforming Ethiopia via the developmental state. That's the subtitle actually, developmental state. Via the developmental state, the infrastructure connecting Ethiopia via all weather roads, via rail, railroad. It's incredible. They, 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 they founded so many universities, up to 50 universities, where the quality of education, I questioned. However, it doesn't matter. You first establish the institution, and then the quality is going to come. Follow. So no one is comparable to them. Industrial parks, incredible. At this hour, I've lived in Addis Ababa for so many years. Uh, I know it very well. Oh, it used to look like incredible, like a village town thing. Now it's a cosmo cosmopolitan uh, uh, city that actually is compared to a European city and many other uh, cities in Africa. It's because of APRDF. There was no such thing as light, li light rail in Addis Ababa. It was established by the APRDF. And the dam, <laughs> the Renaissance dam, was an initiated by, by the APRDF, more specifically in Madras Zianawi. Okay, so they have done very well in the foundational economy. So I was not, I was not simply criticizing; I was giving them credit as well, because I'm a scholar. I have to have a balanced outlook on any issue. 
that was what I have done actually, really. But anyway, the problem is this. We've got to also consider the psychology of Ethiopians, of Habesha people. If they are criticized, they're going to read that criticism only. If you give them credit, they're not going to see that. That's another problem we have. Well, I think, you know, criticism is, is always um, um, welcome. And um, if anything, um, we should continue writing critical um, articles about Ethiopia, about Tigray. Uh, that's the only way things could, could change. But to, to come to where we are now, uh, Professor, in terms of the war, we're being told that the war has ended, um, I think it's um, seven months or eight months since the, uh, the Praetorium um, agreement was uh, was signed and on the one hand it looks like there is some semblance of peace um, at least diplomats are um, 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 you know shuttling from Addis to, to Matalem and there is illusion that a lot of positive things are um, happening in Tigray but on the other hand the fundamentals seem to be um, where they were before um, Western Tigray is still occupied um, Southern Tigray yeah. this large swath of Western Tigray um, Southern Tigray is still um, occupied, um, Eastern Tigray, Europe, um, still occupied by Eritrean forces, and nothing happens in Tigray without the permission of the federal regime, and there isn't a lot of things that the federal regime is uh, permitting. Um, so it's a very, it's a mishmash and, and confused um, situation um, in, in Tigray. But maybe, maybe I'm going to ask you what, what you think, uh, what your assessment is of what is happening uh, and um, what do you think is the way out uh, as well? And uh, that okay. would be my, my final question. Okay, very good, very good. I think I, I can stay until three o'clock. After that, I have to go. Anyway, this is also good because uh, everybody is talking about it. But it, it just raised everybody's talking about it. But it's uh, what's going on in Tigray right now is, uh, uh, it's not surprising to me. It's not surprising to me at all because, uh, because when, uh, when uh, TPLF signed the Pretoria Accord with, uh, with the Abbey government, they actually were not on equal terms. That's the major problem. The, 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 the TPLF uh, uh, signs, uh, sometimes, you know, I, uh, some people were saying, we'll be surprised if the TPLF is going to sign, but they did. In Pretoria, the Western Tigray question was not raised at all. You see? And then in Pretoria, when they said a TPLF, they want to dislodge the TDF, <laughs> Tigray Defense Forces, uh, disarm the Tigray Defense Forces. They are going to disarm themselves. They signed for that too, but they should have asked, okay, we can do that. However, the Amahara, fun, no. How about the Alfara, fun? How about the, uh, it, uh, the Eritrean forces? that are still occupying Tigray territory. They should have said that too. That was not raised at all. So the, the, the Pretoria Accord says, okay, with respect to foreign forces, who are foreign forces? It was, uh, they should have clearly stated Eritrean forces, okay? The, but they did not do it. They said foreign forces, and then, then of course, uh, the Fan no and what have you in terms of uh, telling these people to leave Tigray, the responsibility is that of the federal government, it says, in the Pretoria <laughs> agreement. But the, the, the government is not doing anything about it. From Sheraro up to Europe in Northern Tigray, it's occupied by, still occupied by the, by the Eritrean forces. Fano is still sitting in Walkait and Sagade, in Salamti as well. Still sitting in Raya as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke. I mean, so 
Pretoria was not really uh, practically converted as it was expected. It did not do, they are not doing it at all. But uh, anyway, with, with all its deformity uh, and uh, shortcomings, this is good for Tigra because they can actually move around uh, within some limitations. They can move around, they can do things like Geta Chorada is doing now. He's gone to the Amhara regional state and, and then initiated a dialogue with them. The schools have started in Tigray. Some aid is coming to Tigray. <laughs> some of this is stolen, of course. You know, it's a sham. Uh, I mean, it's very sad that these people are stealing from the poor Tigray people. But anyway, they are getting aid. The Chinese have gone last time. Uh, Chinese ambassador, the French ambassador was there uh, last time as well to go and support Tigray materially uh, and diplomatically as well. That's a good thing because that's the peace dividend itself. Had they continued the war, <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> how many people were going to die in Tigray. There was a savage war. It was a genocidal war. 120,000 of our women were raped. I mean, this is incredible. And then and, and, uh, people are not talking about the accountability and responsibility of those criminal elements, okay? So uh, there's so many problems, but anyway, sometimes, you know, there's a problem and then uh, uh, we have a problem, but we have to move on, I have to say. That's the only choice Tigray has now, okay? But ultimately, I wish not only for Tigray, but for the whole of Ethiopia, that some sensible people come and then uh, uh, by a dialogue and, and, and uh, they come to uh, national uh, reconciliation and by a national reconciliation to what I call peaceful coexistence. That's, that's the only way to go. Otherwise, we're gonna have a problem for a long period of time, long period of time. So the, I wish something is gonna come out of this. Uh, that's how I see it anyway. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned you mentioned think that the, the, the Tigray negotiators um, failed to do in terms of not explicitly um, saying something about Western Tigray and Southern Tigray and about the disarmament of other um, special forces, whether that is the FANO and, and other forces. Um, again, I, I don't have have evidence in terms of what transpired, what happened in the, during the negotiation. But my sense is that the federal regime wasn't going to budge, wasn't going to accept saying Western Tigray, for instance, because that would be implicitly legitimizing the claim that Western Tigray is indeed in, in Tigray. But of course, they didn't want to, to say that. And also, given that the Tigray, uh, the Tigray negotiation team was um, negotiating from a relatively weakened position, I think they would have demanded a lot, but then they didn't quite have the, the leverage to, 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 to demand uh, much. I think um, that is maybe what happened, but of, you can't rule out incompetence as well. So maybe I, we would know um, in time. But regarding Western Tigray, uh, from, from Amhara's perspective, again, to, to sort of... Uh, um, to 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 give credence to them to the to the claim, which is otherwise outrageous to me. Uh, what they would say is that Western Tigray was illegally annexed in 1991. Um, it was taken then by Tigray forces by force, and now um, the fortunes have sort of reversed, and the Amhara forces have reclaimed it by force, and that they 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 have they have a right to cement control and to annex it. That, that is what they would say. Um, what is your view about that? And that's actually the reason why I earlier I asked you to give us a bit of historical context in terms of Western Tigray and Southern Tigray and what the what Tigrayans think of, of those um, territories. Okay, very good. 
I see the problem is the problem with Western Tigray is uh, those uh, Amahara elites and fighting forces like like uh, like Fano and 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 then uh, so-called uh, militia and what have you, special forces. Uh, they have a narrow conception of history, and uh, they either know or don't know. I have no idea, but they want to start in 1991. 1991 is a very recent history, really. They never mentioned 1949, 1948. Walkai, it was actually be, be, uh, incorporated into Begemador in 1948. It was part of Tigray until that period. Kobo, Raya was incorporated into Wolo in 1949. Before that, before that, actually, it was part of Tigray. They never mentioned this thing. I have a lot of evidences on this. I have written about it actually. And then if you go to like four years before, before uh, Wolkite uh, uh, was given to Begemudur, then Begemudur was not Gundur. And then this was testified. Test, test, we have two testimonials actually of Rasmenger Shasium who is still alive. And of uh, of uh, 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 Bayena Moos, Fitorari Bayena Moos, who are still alive too, who were part of the governor of Tigray, and Moos Bayena was a parliamentarian and advisor to the emperor. They've seen it themselves, eyewitness accounts. They even asked why Kobo is going to be part of Wolo. And the response from the government was for, for administrative purposes. Okay. I myself have found so many documents in 1945, that is uh, four years before uh, Kobo was gone and uh, three years before Wolkite was gone. I found a receipt. Uh, uh, it says Ethiopia, Nugusana, Gus, Mangus. But the great Mazagajavit, Yegim Javit, the Rasing. Ekobo and Alamata Mazagajavit. Look, Kobo and Alamata as part of the Grai. This is four years before, before Kobo was gone. They were reporting from Alamata and Kobo to Mughale uh, Rasit. <laughs> so we have so many evidences. But anyway, if these people claiming, claiming, that Kobo was actually, uh, not Kobo, actually the Raya, Alamat, and Koram. They are talking about actually Kobo is still part of Amahara, or he is to be from of the Grai. And um, they also should um, should uh, should uh, investigate uh, the history, the 17th century to present as a matter of fact. And they have found so many evidence actually Manuel Baradas is the guy who came to, uh, they call it Abyssinia, Ethiopia then, but the, most of them were coming to Tigray. Manuel Baradas, a missionary, Portuguese missionary who lived between Aksum and Adwa, 1630s, okay? He wrote his book in 1634, and uh, it's called, uh, it's called, a 17th century historical and geographical account of Tigray. 1634, thanks to Richard Pankras, it was translated from Portuguese into English in 1996, and I found this book. And he talks about Tigray, the extent of Tigray, beyond Takaze, up to Limalimo. <laughs> some say Takaze, but some say Limalimo, he says. Then Emmanuel Almeida came also after him, and he says uh, Tigray begins uh, at the two twin ports of Masawa and Hergigo, <laughs> the whole of Eritrea uh, no, was part of Tigray then. And then also Emmanuel Malada said Tigray is the head and foundation of Ethiopia, he says. Then we have J. Ludolf, who wrote a book in 1682, and he said Tigray has 27 provinces. <laughs> Tigray provinces by mean Auraja, you know, the districts. 
during Emperor Haile Selassie, Tigray had only eight provinces, eight sub-provinces, because Tigray itself was a province then. But uh, Rudolf in 1682 says 27 provinces and Wag is part of Tigray. He says Wag is in Lastana. John Houghton writes Abyssinia and its people. And uh, he will actually mostly talks about the famous monasteries in Tigray. And he said the famous monasteries are Aksum, Gundagunde, uh, uh, Debra Dammo, and, and then, uh, and then Waldeba as part of Tigray. And Waldeba is in Walkite, you know that, okay? Uh, uh, and then this is Nubia. And then we have Michael Russell, whose book is Abyssinia, Nubia and Abyssinia. And then uh, Michael Russell also says, Walkite and Lasta are part of Tigray. <laughs> So there are so many of them. And then we have, finally, we have uh, Giovanni Allero. Giovanni Allero writes in 1930s when Mussolini came and invaded Ethiopia again. Giovanni Allero was uh, administrator of Adigrat first. Then he was transferred to Walkite. So he said, Walkite is as part of Tigray, I administer as part of Tigray. And he, wrote, he wrote a book in it, Italian, of course, Il Walkite, it says. And I read that book. So clearly he says Walkite was part of Tigray. And then luckily we have now, just recently, I'm sure you are also aware of that, that this is a map produced by Professor uh, John Nissen. The 1849 map of Tigray. And when I see that map, you see that map, you can actually clearly see Walkite as part of Tigray. He says Amhara and Tigray. And then clearly there's a borderline between, between Tigray and Amhara. And Walkite was in Tigray. This, this map was published in the 19th century, of course, by uh, Carl Fleming publishers. Okay? Then, like I told you before, the testimonials of Rasmin Gesha and what have you. This has to be considered too. And the 1949, 1948, even if they don't want to hear this history, they should go by the constitution as well. The constitution, they are not just grabbing the land. They have took a loss during, uh, during the formation of the nine color. It lost some to Afar, like Dalon, like Shahat, Shahat, even interestingly, Shahat speak to Grinya, actually, they speak to Grinya. They are part of Afar now. Galor, <laughs> Northern Afar, the bulk of Afar speaks to Grinya and Afar. But they are part of Afar. So Tigray has lost some lands, actually, as a matter of fact. So th that's the way it is. Either you have to go by the constitution or go by history. We have plenty of evidence on that. Well, um, thank you for that. That was a um, comprehensive um, presentation of, of the evidence. I mean, I have always known that the evidence for Western Tigray um, being part of Tigray is overwhelming, if not conclusive. Uh, and as far as I'm, I'm concerned, there is no any ground for for for, um, for claiming that you know it it it, it has it has ever been an um, Amhara territory or anything of that of that nature. But still. Um, as you know, they are calling it contested area, although um, th the claim from Tigray and from Amhara um, is of equal weight. That is how it's being presented. Um, and uh, maybe people like you should, should write and, and present the, the evidence in a way that other people could, could see. Um, I don't know. But um, because you said you have a couple of minutes, I'm going to um, squeeze okay. a, a couple of questions about Eritrea. I think we haven't mentioned anything uh, okay. about Eritrea. Um, now, I know that Tigray is not in a position to, to conduct any sort of foreign policy on its own, but what do you think um, is the way for, um, for, for any possible reconciliation or rapprochement between Tigray and Eritrea? 
uh, and maybe to grow within the context of Ethiopia. What, what, how do you see um, the the tension between um, Eritrea and, and and Tigray sort of thawing and uh, and um, conditions returning to some sort of uh, normality? I think it's going to be really, really difficult to uh, reconcile with Eritrea because uh, the problem is uh, that country is now governed by just one man. Okay, had there been some uh, some kind of uh, 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 different groups that uh, uh, move within 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 Eritrea that can pressurize or influence the government, uh, but there is no so, such sort of movement or opposition uh, party. There is no constitution. There is no parliament. It's a one-man show, actually. So you have to deal with Isaias Aborke. You have no choice. Isaias Aborke has to listen. He's done so, many, so much damage to Tigray. He's committed so uh, uh, unbelievable crime against the people of Tigray. So even if you want to set aside that thing and negotiate with him, the first thing he should do is leave Tigray now. The Eritrean troops that are in Shararo, in Adiabo, in, in uh, the western Tigray of the Umara Amhajar area, and then in Rama, and then in Zalambesa, and in Iraq. They have to completely abandon Tigray. Then you can talk about peace, lasting peace, because ultimately we're going to live together. We're gonna, we are neighbors. Eritrea and Tigray are going to be there forever. A hundred years from now, different generations are going to emerge. They're going to live together. So we have to really uh, uh, do something about it. That there could be a lasting peace. But now, at this very moment, I don't think it's possible because the guy in, a, in, in Azmara is so rigid, he's not going to accept it. And the guy at Arat Kilo. Is not saying anything about it because they have signed a treaty, a secret treaty with Isaias a long time ago. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, uh, Bacha Dabala recently said uh, all of them are gone the, from Eritrea. Eritrean forces have left to cry. Fondo have left. It's a, a, a whitewash lie. We know for sure that they, they've not, they, they're still sitting there. We know for sure. So uh, if the government of Ethiopia changed its mind, uh, according to Pretoria, uh, which is by the way, it's responsibility, like I said earlier. And then uh, Mike Hammer is pressurizing now and he gave them the last chance for Eritreans to leave. We will have to see and wait. We have to wait and see. But I don't think that's going to happen soon. It will take a while. I think the best bet for, for the Getacho Radha led transitional government is to deal with the Amhara, deal with other Ethiopians, deal with the, the federal government, and to try to pacify uh, overall that region. Uh, but I, I don't ever see anything coming out from Eritrea, really. I don't see that. Maybe I could be wrong. I don't know. Hmm. Well, um, we're going to we're going to wait and see, as I said. Uh, but uh, thank you for um, for taking the time um, today. Um, I think it was so educational, and I'm sure lots of my viewers are going to find, especially the. Um, um, historical background that you gave us from starting from I don't know uh, three thousand um, years before, uh, ago um, until uh, modern Ethiopia. Um, people are going to find it very very educational, and um, thank you very much for uh, for that. Uh, and maybe I don't know if you have some um, final concluding remarks that you want to say. I'm going to give you that opportunity, but um, otherwise we're going to leave it at that. No, I thank you very much, Takalai, Gabra, Mikhail, <laughs> for this opportunity. It was really wonderful. 
uh, what I want to say to you actually is, uh, this is really a good program because especially for the diaspora uh, immigrants and other Ethiopians, uh, they speak English, you know. Uh, they were born here in Europe and, and in the United States, in Australia and New Zealand, some of them. The, so this uh, via English. So in the future too, you have to come up with this kind of program. Uh, I can cooperate with you uh, in doing something like a special program where we can educate our people. And then, then you know, uh, that's I think our responsibility to do that. So think about it. Oh, thank you. That would be that would be wonderful. Yeah, I would think about that and get back um, to yeah. you. So that was uh, Professor Galaudi <laughs> um, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, staying with us. And I have been Taklai. And um, until next time, bye bye. Thank you, Taklai. Thank you very much. Yes, sir.